Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. Tell me who can stand before us when we go in his great name. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, we have the victory. Praise God. How many feel victorious tonight? Amen. If you feel victorious, just put your hands together and thank God for it. If you don't feel victorious, put your hands together and thank God for it. Amen. Joy cometh in the morning. And uh, God, the Bible says God always, always causes us to triumph through Christ Jesus. So I don't know what you're going through tonight, what you're facing, what trials you might be having, but we have a sure word of prophecy that God will always cause us to triumph through Christ. Look at somebody said, I am an overcomer. I'm a victor. I'm a victor. I am, my name's not Victor, <laughs> but I am victorious in Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Uh, Brother Harper has some things he has to attend to, and we need to pray for him and his wife tonight. And nothing bad, but just uh, keep him in your prayers. And also, I want to welcome or say happy birthday to Sister Atkins back there. Let's, uh, let's give her a hand for her birthday. I'm not going to say how old she is, but when I found out, I thought that can't be possible. She does not look that age. So she's either got a good husband or it's the Holy Ghost keeping her young. Praise God. Thank God for the opportunity tonight to teach behind this sacred desk. Thank you to the bishop. And thank you to all the men and women that helped in the service tonight, the musicians, the singer, Brother, uh, Brother High, and Brother Daniel Ramonette. We thank you guys. Do you love the Lord? Amen. The Lord is so good to us, and He is deserving of every praise that we can give Him. Amen. And uh, sometimes the Spirit of the Lord is not limited in just one way of moving. And God is not limited in just one way of moving in our life. I have seen the services where on one side of the building people would be running and jumping for the row, and on the other end, people were weeping and crying. And somewhere in the middle, people were laughing. And uh, it looked like we all had a, a fit going on, but it was the Spirit of God. It was the same Spirit moving. Uh, when, have you been in a service where people just started laughing under the Holy Ghost and couldn't stop? That joy that comes on you? Well, we sure need, in this day and age, we sure need a dose of joy, don't we? And the Bible says that uh, God gives, He is the source of that joy. And that we can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen? Amen. Turn your Bibles tonight to Isaiah chapter 64. Uh, August the 14th on a Sunday night at 6.30 we're going to have a regular service. But in that service we're going to have a graduation for some of our Purpose Institute students. I think we have four that uh, from our local campus. We're talking about maybe combining with another campus in Clarksburg. They might come here. I don't know how it's going to work out yet. But Brother Davenport, who is up in Morgantown, he's the district uh, director for PI, Purpose Institute. He'll be here conferring those uh, diplomas upon the students. And then also we'll, uh, he'll be preaching that night as well. So we're looking forward to that evening. And so please be mindful of that. We'll have, afterwards, we'll have a little cake and refreshment because we want to acknowledge those who have given time and energy to learn more about the Word of God so they can be better men and women of God and also be ministers 
in this last day? How many know we need all the tools we can get to lead people to Jesus? Amen? So Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all, everybody say we all, are the work of thy hand. Look at somebody and just tell them, I want to be a work of grace. Would you pray for me? Lord, I love you tonight. I thank you for your people that are here, Jesus. I thank you for your spirit that's here already. Thank you, Lord, for the atmosphere that's been changed by your spirit and by the worship that we give you, God. Bless these people that are here in Jesus' name. And everyone said, in, in Jesus' name. You may be seated. I'm going to talk to you tonight about the potter's work of grace. The potter's work of grace. The Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and he said, go down to the potter's house and there I will cause thee to hear my word. So Jeremiah went down to the potter's house and behold, he saw the potter working so that he wrought a work on the wheels. He was at the potter's wheel. And the vessel he made was of clay, and the Bible says it was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel that seemed good to the potter to make it. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. God tonight has us in his hands. First of all, remember the song we sang as children. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 Sing it with me. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Another part of it says, he's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister. He's just got everybody in his hands. And the Bible says that when you're in a father's hand, no man can pluck you out. It's the safest place you can be is in the hand of the Father. And it's also true that it's the safest place you can be is in the hand of the potter. When God begins to mold your life and work on you and, and begin to make, if you're pliable and you're malleable in His hands, He will make you into a vessel of honor, even if you're marred in His hands, even if you've got some issues. How many got issues? Amen. Thank you. Almost everybody, ready. we all got issues. Uh, sometimes our issues become other people's issues too, don't they? And so we're working. We're, we're staying on that potter's wheel. You know, if you went down to the potter's house and you began to watch what he was doing, you would see that he would go into a barrel, sometimes an old oaken barrel, and he'd pull out a piece of clay, and he would take that clay and he would begin to work on it. He would look at it. He would push it a little bit and, and mold it and, and see. He might even punch it. There might be bubbles in that clay. He's trying to get that clay molded just right and ready so he can throw it on the wheel. And sometimes the, 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 the clay is ready, but many times it's not. And so he will wrap that, that clay back up in that bag and he'll put that clay back in that barrel full of water. He'll let it cure a little longer. and He'll pull out another piece of clay and, and he'll work on that. And, and as he's beginning to work on it, maybe this one will be right. And he'll put it on the potter's wheel then begin to to, to, uh, to work on it and to mold it and let that wheel spin. And, and sometimes, have you ever seen it when a potter's working? We used to watch videos of it sometimes on YouTube or you've been to a, a place where they have a pottery. I mean, one year I went to a conference and they had somebody out in the vestibule there because the conference was being formed until Christ be formed in you. It was because of the times, 2012 or 13, and they had people out there, artisans working, and, and they had one lady working with a potter's wheel, and as she began to work and spin, that potter's wheel was spinning, that clay would move, and, and all of a sudden you start getting, it started getting wobbly, and then it would collapse on itself. 
And what she did was she would take that and she would mold it back together again, form it, and make sure that its integrity was strong and put it back into place. And it would start spinning. She would start forming it again until she had a complete vessel. And then what they did with that clay after that was they began to put it in the fire and burned it. They put it in a kiln so that they could harden that, that vessel, that clay. And then it was finished and it was totally uh, warm, uh, cold now. And the heat of the kiln was over with. It was a vessel that could be used for whatever it was designed to be used as. The Bible says that God said he made it again another vessel. It also says that he was going to rot a work on the wheels. And you tonight are the work that is on the wheel of life. And God has you on that potter's wheel, and he is forming you and making you. And it is in a process that we call grace. Grace is more than just a prayer that we pray when we sit down to eat dinner, breakfast, or lunch. How many say, somebody say grace, or somebody bless the table? But that's, we're not, that's not the grace that we're talking about tonight. And, and grace is also more than just unmerited favor. We do receive unmerited favor. Great, that's one of the definitions of grace. And it's good to have the unmerited favor. And none of us deserve the blessings of God. Amen? How many can raise your hand and say, I deserve everything God's given me? Nobody can say that. But God's unmerited favor, it's true that there is an element of grace having to do with that. But if you just limit the definition of grace to that kind of idea, then you are robbing the grace of God of its true meaning, its true purpose, and its intent. Because the Bible says that grace is a teacher. It's teaching us. Uh, some say that we live, since we live in the age of grace, in the church age, that God's not going to judge believers like He did in the Old Testament in other periods of time. But if you read the New Testament, you see that there were some people that were judged very strongly and harshly, even in the age of grace, because of the way that they mistreated the Spirit of God. Remember the man and the woman that lied to Peter about the money that they had received for selling property. And Peter said, you're not lying to me. You're lying to the Holy Ghost. And the man was struck dead. The wife comes in later, and she follows along with the same plan. And he says, the men that carried out your husband, they're waiting outside the door for you. And she falls over dead. Judgment, even in the age of grace. Now, we serve a God of love. Amen? We serve a God of love and of mercy. But we also serve a God of discipline and of judgment. And sometimes we think of discipline just as a negative thing, but the Bible lets us know that grace is teaching us. Turn your Bible tonight to uh, the book of Titus, if you would. Titus chapter 2, 11 to 14. And so it simply says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should have soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. What's the next verse? Is that the last one? These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise Thee. God wants us to be malleable in his hands and he wants us to be pliable on the potter's wheel and he uses the process of grace to do that. So grace is a teacher. And sometimes the best lessons in life that we learn come from encounters with discipline. How many would raise your hand and say, I was spanked as a child? If you weren't spanked as a child... You should have been. There's something about that. But discipline doesn't just have to do with that kind of discipline. How many know about telling, you tell a kid going to time out? Uh, and that works for some kids. That would not have worked for me. I can tell you that right now. Uh, some kids, it works if you take their phone away today. Some children, it works if you sit them in a room where there's no electronic devices and they just have to sit there. But, but however you choose to, dis to discipline the child that you're disciplining, 
you've got to find a way to get through their head that what you've done is wrong and you need to change your behavior. And the Lord uses the process of grace to help change our behavior and our patterns of doing things. The Bible says the grace of God that brings us salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, that denying ungodliness is the wickedness of this world. And worldly lust is our desire for the things of this world. And then we're going to be righteous, we're going to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world as we take on this rod of correction, if you will, from the Lord. Sometimes it seems like they're drastic measures to get people to change. Sometimes you have to, how many have known of children that have been, had to be sent away to boarding school somewhere because they were such uh, malcontent? Sometimes that works. And many times it just made them more clever at what they were doing. But... You have to find a way to do that. Now, the Bible says, in the book of Proverbs, I believe it is, that you're supposed to train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. Okay? And in the Jewish thought, that simply means that you look at the child that you're raising and you see the way they're bent and the way they should go. If they are a learner that's tactile, hands-on kind of learner, then you're going to put them in positions to learn that way because that's the best way they can succeed. If they're book smart, you're going to send them to schools. You're going to send them to some kind of seminars. You're going to find a way that your child or the person that's under your authority learns and then you raise them that way and they, they're going to have a successful life. If you try to force a child who is not a book kind of kid to just do that all the time, they're not going to be as successful as you just let them have hands on. I know people in this room tonight who have experience with engineering, but they were not book smart. They did it through having the ability to figure things out and to apply that knowledge with their hands on training. So there are different ways that people learn. God understands that when he works with us individually. I'm not going to learn the same way as Sister Annie's going to learn. But God is going to discipline us according to how, what works best for us to grow in Him. Because we're all trying and striving to get to the same place. The Bible said that He wants us to be perfect. It also says to be whole, holy. It talks about also that He wants to he make you whole in your spirit, soul, and body. That word perfect doesn't mean without imperfections. That word perfect doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to have mistakes in life. What that means is God is working to complete in us a wholeness so that he can work through us. Now, we find our completeness, we find our wholeness in Jesus Christ. That's where I found my wholeness. When I allowed myself to finally submit to God and he became everything that I needed. We heard the preacher talk about this on Sunday, that he's all in all. He's the almighty God. And we find our completeness in his completeness. Okay? And so the word grace simply means that it is the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life, including gratitude. We reflect when we're allowing grace to teach us, we begin to reflect God's divine influence to other people. It hits our heart and then it reflects out of us. This is why the devil hates us so much. Because he was the anointed cherub that covereth. He had every type of precious stone on his vesture. He was clothed with it. And he reflected the light of God. But he began to get the big head and thought that he was equal with God. He wasn't equal with God. He was just simply a reflection of God's divine nature. And so the Bible says that no flesh is going to glory in his presence. We're not glorying in his presence. We're simply reflecting his presence. And so in the book of Romans, when it says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and also put on the armor of God, those are interchangeable terms. The armor of God is putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. The helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace, your loins good about with truth, all those things are reflections of God. Even the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. We put on that armor, we're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have become a reflection of Him to the world. But we do that through the process 
of grace. So when a child of God is properly educated by grace, the heart of that student has been changed. It's been molded by the Holy Ghost. And our, the Holy Ghost is our counselor. He's our guide. He's our helper. And oftentimes people feel the, the nudge of the Holy Spirit and they either obey it or they go and do their own thing. I like to make the uh, illustration many times. The Holy Ghost, uh, we says the Holy Ghost, he's a counselor. But we don't always pay attention to our counselors. You might go to a lawyer and he'll say, now you should do this, this, and this. And you walk out the door and you go do what you want to do. You might go to a guidance counselor or somebody and they say, this is what you ought to do to, to get this ready so you can go to this particular college. And you say, you know, I don't want to do it that way. And then you find yourself 20 years down the road wondering, why didn't I listen to that guy? It would have been far better off I had. But you didn't listen to the counselor. Many times the Holy Ghost will come and he'll try to stop you from making a mistake. The Bible says when temptation comes, the Lord will make a way of escape for you. But the problem is we don't always look for the escape routes. And everybody's tempted when they're drawn away of their own lust and enticed, their own desires. Uh, temptation is common to man. It's going to happen. But you're tempted when you're drawn away of your own lust and enticed. And then the Bible says when lust conceives, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? It's death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there is this battle going on in us, this battle between the light and the darkness, the battle between this world and the Spirit of God that's inside of us. We are caught between, and we have to make decisions on a daily basis. And sometimes we make the right decision, and sometimes we make the wrong decisions. But grace comes along to teach you how to make the right decisions choices if you'll let it. In fact, even after you, maybe you have sinned, maybe you have made a mistake, maybe you have done something you should not have done and you knew you shouldn't have done it at the time. You repent of your sins, you say, God, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. And he forgives you. Now that doesn't give you a license to sin. The grace of God is not a get out of jail free card that you get when you play a monopoly. But the grace of God is simply the way that he teaches you. And so after you make the mistake, after you sincerely repent before God, you can reflect back and see where you allow this thing to come into your life or that influence or, or that particular situation to develop. And that drew you away. Your lust were fed. Your desires were fed for something that you shouldn't do, say, think, or act upon. And then you did it. And then you say, you know what? The next time I see that enemy coming, I'm going to go the other way. Now, the beautiful thing about living for the Lord is that we learn some things. I have learned, this is me personally, I have learned that when I'm tempted to make wrong choices, that's a coded word, by the way. Everybody say sin. Say it again. Sin. We need to be authentic with one another, right? We need to be real with one another. When I'm tempted to sin, whether it's against myself, God, or other people, I have found that that is an indication of something. That the enemy knows there's something about to happen in the spirit realm. And he is trying to distract me from what God's about to do. So now I don't see temptation as some kind of a curse or some kind of a problem. Now I see that when temptation comes, I'm looking. Okay, what does God want me to do today? Where is he trying to send me? Because if temptation's coming, then the enemy's trying to sidetrack me and get me distracted from what God wants to do in my life or in somebody else's life for that day. And we all have an assignment today. Each one of us has an assignment. The commission wasn't just for the apostles. It's for every one of us to go into the highways and the byways to compel people to come in and to teach them about Jesus. We do that in different ways. Some teach them by sitting down in Bible studies. Some teach them by simply living the life in front of them. And they're watching you. They know what kind of vessel you are, what kind of grace you're displaying, whether you're malleable. Sometimes people come into a church and they act one thing on Sunday, and the rest of the week there's somebody else you wouldn't even recognize. They're chameleons. They act one way around the body of Christ, and they act one way around the people that are not born again. And God is not pleased with that kind of behavior. He wants a people that are sincere before him. That's why the Bible says we're supposed to worship the Lord in sincerity and in truth. 
We are worshiping Him in that way. And so your worship to God doesn't begin when you walk in these doors and sit in that pew or stand up and begin to sing songs. The worship that you give God is what you do every day when you're waking up and when you go to bed at night, how you act, how you treat people, and how you talk with God. Your lifestyle of worship is what He's looking at. Grace is teaching you how to live that proper lifestyle so you can deny ungodliness and worldly desires and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That word soberly has to do with the fact that you are balanced and have a sound mind. How many want to have a sound mind? How many have gone through a day and thought, man, this is the craziest, most mixed up day I've ever had in my life. I don't even know how I kept my sanity. Am I the only one? It's by the grace of God. He helps me keep my soberness and my righteousness. It's not my righteousness, by the way. The Bible says our righteousness is what? It's filthy rags. It's His righteousness. It's not my glory. It's His glory. When I take on His divine nature, I am simply reflecting the glory of God. And so if I begin to take credit for that, God will not be pleased by that. And also the Bible says something else about discipline. He says that he chastises those that he loves. And when my father would chastise me, when he would discipline me, he didn't do it because he hated me. In fact, the opposite is true. If he didn't, if he hated me, he would not have chastised me in the first place. So oftentimes people think, well, I don't want to hurt little Susie's feelings or little Bobby. I don't want... And listen, Bobby and Susie need to be disciplined if you really love them or else they're going to grow up to be spoiled, entitled brats that don't know how to live properly in this world. So I am working in the process of grace, allowing myself to be formed and molded by God. Pinch yourself real quick and, look, and just say, I'm fleshy. Now, if the person beside you didn't pinch themselves, go ahead and give them a little nudge there. I'm fleshy. I'm carnal. Uh, Paul said, I'm carnal, sold under sin. I, I'm, I'm in this body, but I got some things I got to work on. So, because we're human, we're predisposed because of the fall of Adam in the garden. We're predisposed to rebellion and sin. We're going to make bad choices. We're going to make sinful choices sometimes. We're going to do things we shouldn't do. And so the Lord is working on us to help us. So grace is not just the good feelings that you get, the goosebumps and all that. And that's wonderful. I love it when the Spirit of God comes on me. I feel the hairs raise on my arms, and I feel that chill go down my back, and I get that unction from the Holy One. I know that's the Spirit of God. I love it. But I'm learning to love the rod of correction because that is a display of His love. I might not really be maturing much when I'm feeling all those wonderful feelings of the Spirit but I'm really growing when he's discipling me through discipline. When he's saying, Steve, you shouldn't have done that. And there's like a spiritual smack that comes around and gets me where I deserve it because I am allowing him to teach me. There are some who revel in a cheap grace, though. It's the sort of grace that reveals their selfish desire to receive all the benefits that God has without changing their lifestyle of sin. They come to God, they want everything that God has for them, but they don't want to make a commitment to Him. That is a form of cheap grace. Cheap grace that does not follow the principles of the, words of God, of the Word of God. Refuses to allow God to mold them and make them. And so there are others who are simply ignorant. Some are willingly that way. And then there are some people just ignorant of the ways of God. And they have to be taught. And that's how grace is teaching them slowly. I'm so thankful that I've had teachers. How many have had men and women that have taught you about living for the Lord? 
I was just talking to my wife about that on the way here to church tonight. I, I, I have so many people in my life that have poured into me in different ways. And sometimes I get frustrated because I've got all this stuff that's been poured into me. And I'm thinking, I'm not doing a good enough job to pour that out to somebody else. I don't want to die being full. I want to die being empty and emptying myself into other people so that all the great benefits that I've received, I can then give to other people. Not because I feel like I'm some great one, but because I'm thankful for what God has given me, what he's taught me. How many of you have met people that you want to be like? They have been examples to you about how to be a good Christian. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, he was very emphatic. Follow me as I follow Christ. The moment Paul stops following Christ, you need to stop following him. Thankfully, we have a pastor here who is following Christ. Amen? And so our bishop is an example to us of how we ought to live. And that's how it is biblically, that we have this divine order. The pastor is going to be the shepherd, the under-shepherd over the sheep of God. And so this is what we follow. We follow him as he follows Christ. But Jesus also said that we're supposed to take up our cross and follow him. He didn't say, take up my cross. Jesus had his own cross to bear. You have your own cross to bear. You're supposed to take it up. And living that life of self-denial, follow after Him. So do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Uh, Because when you despise God's chastening, you're actually pushing away the love of God. And that despite, that disrespect, that that, uh, resentment towards God's hand of discipline is stymieing you and causing you to stay in one spot. You're not growing in God. You're not growing in grace because you're despising the grace of God in your life. So if you have felt the chastisement of God, rejoice. He wants you to live holy. Because we're looking, the Bible said in that passage, for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking for. One of these days, the trumpet of God's going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're supposed to comfort one another. Those words bring comfort to us. There is a great day coming. But oftentimes, people have misunderstood what's going on in the realm of the Spirit. See, when you were born again, you received a sign initially that you were born again. You repented. You, uh, first of all, you had faith for Jesus Christ. You repented of your sins. And then you were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Or sometimes people get the Holy Ghost and then they were baptized in the name of Jesus. But regardless, that's what happened when you were born again. You began to speak with other tongues as God's Spirit gave you the utterance. And that was the sign that you were born again. But that was not the evidence that you were born again. The evidence is something totally different. I like this illustration. Brother Rowe gave it to me a long time ago, back in 2009. We talked about the difference between signs and evidence. He said, if you go to the grocery store and you walk in there and it says bread. You see a sign that says bread, $3.00. I like Heiner's or Sara Lee. You go in there and see Heiner's, $3. Well, that's the sign. I haven't seen the bread yet, but I've seen the sign. But when I go down the bread aisle, there's Heiner's. That's the evidence. That's how it is when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The sign was you spoke with other tongues. Speaking in tongues is not the Holy Ghost. Speaking in tongues is a sign that you've received the gift of of the Holy Ghost. The evidence that the Holy Ghost is working in your life is that you are displaying the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That's the fruit of the Spirit. I am displaying that fruit. And that fruit is simply a reflection of His divinity working through me. All right? So when I'm in a situation where I need the love of God because I have the Holy Ghost, God's love in me rises to the moment. When I'm in a situation 
where I need the joy of God, joy comes because I've got the Holy Ghost. It's in me. See, and that's the other thing, too. People say, well, I got the Holy Ghost tonight. Now, they've had the Holy Ghost for 30 years. You didn't get the Holy Ghost. You've always had the Holy Ghost once you receive the Holy Ghost. You can't lose the Holy Ghost. You can't be unborn again. Because once you're born again, you're born again. Once you are adopted by God in this church family, you're adopted by Him. He's not going to send you back out. Because if you make a mistake, guess what? He still loves you. If you mess up so badly you think God would never take me back, He'll take you back. If you're sincere, He'll take you back. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. That means if I hold with affection an evil or unjust act or thought, God's not going to hear me. But He knows your heart. And so He'll hear you if you're sincere. And so the evidence is that fruit. And that's what we have. And so when we have the fruit of the Spirit working in our life, that is God working us on this area of grace. But he also, remember, the the, the definition of grace is the divine influence upon the heart. God's divine influence working upon you. We become partakers of his divine nature when we allow grace to mold us and to shape us in the vessels that God wants to use. God made it again a vessel the way that he wanted that vessel to be. Guess what? You don't get to choose what kind of vessel you are because you're in the hands of the potter. The potter chooses what shape the vessel takes. And you're simply required to be moldable and pliable in his hands. So oftentimes people live a very frustrated existence because they're resisting the hand of the potter. Because they want something a certain way, and God says, no, that's not the way I want that vessel to be. That's not the way I want it to be. And so he's trying to form it, but it's marred in his hands, and it's resisting his hand. And sometimes you've got to get to the place where you humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and let him form you the way that he wants to form you. Because Christ is molding us and forming us in the vessels of honor. Now, there are some vessels that are vessels of dishonor. But it's because they resisted the hand of the mighty God. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm sharing with you two of my favorite passages in the Bible tonight. I love that passage I just read from Titus about grace, the grace of God that brings salvation. And then I love this passage here that Peter is writing, and he's dealing with the divine nature. Because we are reflections of his divine nature. We are trying to take on the divine nature of God, and that's what grace is teaching us to do. It is his divine influence on our heart, and then it's reflected in our life. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And then he says, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be fruit barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. What a promise tonight. If I allow myself to be put in a position where I take on the divine nature of God, I add to my faith virtue, knowledge, uh, temperance, patience, godliness, and brotherly kindness and charity. I will be set in a position where I will never fall. 
For so an entrance shall be mentioned to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I want an entrance into that, abundant, into that kingdom. I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen? I can't do that if I resist the potter's hand. I won't be able to do that if I do not allow myself to be disciplined under his hand. Now, discipline is not easy. It's grievous in the moment. How many have disciplined a child and they acted like in the, that you were committing murder on them? They were fearful of whatever it was going to be. And then you had the ones that were so quiet and stoic, it wouldn't matter what you'd done. Those are the ones that are resisting. There's two forms of resistance there. But it's still resistance. Uh, we're going to go, we're going to let God mold us, but we're going to be kicking and screaming the entire time. Well, you're resisting the mighty hand of God. And so when it says that if you do these things, you shall never fall, and you're going to receive an, a, a, an entrance into the everlasting, everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that is why it says that you're going to not just uh, reflect His nature, but you're also going to have a spirit of gratitude. I'm thankful tonight, and, and I have great gratitude to God, because while I'm on the potter's wheel, and while He is forming me in this process of grace, an entrance is being made for me into heaven. See, when you, when you were baptized and born again, that was just the beginning of your walk with God. That was like the potter taking that clay out of that bucket and looking at it. He's slamming it down on that, on that table and he's punching it and pushing it and kneading it and getting all the bubbles out of it, all the air out of it. That's like, uh, that air is like uh, pride. Man, I... You know, there's a word that's been popping up all over lately. I hear it said all the time from pulpits, and, and it's very disturbing to me. It's this word called pride. I'm very proud of this, or I'm proud of that. Listen, when did the church become proud? I'm thankful. I'm humble. I'm grateful. But I'm not proud. Because pride goes before destruction. And pride takes away from the glory of God. A haughty spirit before a fall. And so we need to be careful that when we talk about how proud we are about things, we take a step back. Well, what am I proud of really? Am I taking glory for this? Well, then if that's not the case, then I'm grateful to God. I'm thankful to God that my children are good in school and, and, and live in life. And I have a, a house where there's no sickness. And, and I'm proud. I'm not proud about all that other stuff. I'm thankful with it. We need to be baptized with a spirit of humility. And only those who stay on the potter's wheel understand the, the, the necessity of being humble because you're allowing yourself to let the potter form you in his hands. And that takes humility. Resistance is that stubborn pride that says, I don't want to do that, God. I'm not going to do it that way. And because you keep on resisting and struggling against the hand of God, that's why God can't bless you the way He wants to bless you. Oh, He wants to bless you. Every good and every perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variance nor shadow of turning. He wants to bless you. But He cannot bless you if you're resisting Him and not allowing yourself to be molded by His hand. Now, how do I know this? Because I've not always been submitted to the master's hand because I'm still on the potter's will. He's still molding me and perfecting me. I'm still working at being humble. I'm still, believe me, I'm still trying to let God form in me what he's trying to form and to make me in the vessel that he wants to make me. I am not going to be perfect or whole or complete if I'm resisting his hand. I need his hand upon my life. The moment you think you don't need God's hand is the moment sure destruction is on the way. 
The moment you think, I got this, I can take care of it all by myself, that's the moment that destruction comes. The moment you think, oh, I got this beat. How many have had the temptation that you've struggled with, a, a problem? The uh, Bible talks about weights and sins. There's a weight, perhaps, or a sin that does so easily beset us. And that thing you think, man, I got victory over that. I got it all taken care of now. I'll never have. And two days later, you're back to the same thing. Because you got off the wheel. And the potter is sitting there, he's saying, get back on this wheel. I, I got to pick you back up. It was barred in his hands. Another place says it was broken in his hands, and he still put it back together. He is putting us and placing us and making us into the men and the women that he wants us to be. Vessels of honor meet for the master's use. So no wonder this definition of gratitude I'm grateful to God because he has made an everlasting entrance into that kingdom, an entrance into that everlasting kingdom for me. I don't deserve that. I don't deserve an entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's nothing good in me. But when he sees me, he doesn't see me. He sees that I'm covered. When you were baptized in his name, you were covered. He, and when he is working on you on that wheel, he's covering you with his hands. He's protecting you. The thing that you thought was the most destructive thing that could happen to you, the worst thing to happen in your life, it might just very well be that God allowed that to happen so that he could form you and make you into the vessel that he wants you to be. There's nothing that you've ever done. See, there's a saying that says, your failures are not final. They're not final. Most of the successful men and women that we read about in history and even our modern day, they failed time and time again. I think it was Edison that said he didn't fail how many thousands of times he did. He just uh, found out things that didn't work in order to make that light bulb and that filament. We're still being formed. We're still letting God mold us and make us in the men and women that he wants us to be. How many will raise your hand and say, I want to stay on the potter's wheel tonight? I want to stay on his wheel. And then they put that in the fire. So you're formed. And he puts you in a fire. Boy, what's a fire do? It's heating you up. It's burning but it's preparing you. It's making you ready to be used by him. There's another illustration I could use tonight. It's about a loaf of bread and wheat. The Bible says the sower went out to sow weed. Weed, not weed. <laughs> he went out to sow wheat. And while he was sowing wheat, seed, he, um, <laughs> thank you very much for that. While he was out there sowing that seed, it landed, some on good ground, some on bad ground. There's four types of soil there. But that which grew was then harvested. And that seed that became the wheat I thought, well, now I'm finally going to be used. I'm ready to be used by God. And so they took that wheat to the threshing floor. And then they would begin to wheat. They would take this iron, uh, it was like a... Um, Oh, it was like a heavy mat, metal mat thing, or wooden, and they would, they would walk around in circles and grind that all the way around there until that chaff and that wheat was separated. Then they would take these, look looked like rakes, and they would throw the, the, the uh, wheat and the chaff up in the air together, and the wheat, if there was a windy day, the chaff would blow away, and the heavier seed would fall to the ground, the wheat. And so as it fell to the ground, then they would collect it, and put it in jars. And then that wheat might think, well, I'm ready to be used now. I'm in the jar. It's time for God to use me. But God's not quite ready to use you yet. And what they do was they would take that jar of wheat and they might put a, a lid on it and they would hide it away somewhere in a dark place. And there it sat. Sometimes we think that God has put us in a position of obscurity. He's put us in a place of darkness. But while you're in that dark season, when you're in that time and you feel like 
Everything about my life is obscure. Everything about my life is, is not uh, clear. And, and I'm not being used to my greatest potential. Whatever, actually what God is doing is he is letting you sit there and he is letting you mature and grow until he has a reason to use you. Because then what happens is when it's finally time to use you, he pulls that earthen vessel out of the ground. He lifts up that lid. You see the light of day. You see the measuring cup. And he puts you, lifts you up. And then he puts you in a bowl. And then he crushes you with a pistol and begins to grind you into a powder. People say, I want to be used by God. Do you really want to be used by God? If you want to be used by God, you're going to be ground. You're going to be you're going to be disintegrated. You're going to have to lose that hard shell, that kernel, so that you can get to what's really important. That's what's inside that wheat. The kernel is not what's important. It's what's inside the wheat that's important, inside that kernel. So he's grinding that thing until it's ready to be used. And then what do they do? They mix it with water or oil, and they knead it. Sometimes it's flat bread, or it's a good old puffy bread that I like with all that big old butter on it. So he's working on that. And then what's he do? Then he thinks, well, now I'm ready to be used. The man, the woman of God that wants to be used by God thinks, well, now I'm finally ready. I have reached this level of grace, and I am a vessel of meat for the master's use, or in this illustration, I'm the bread ready. But what's he do with that? Then they take that and put it in a container and shove it into a fire. And you begin to be baked in the oven. And in that oven, you feel that heat. Trials come. Tribulations come. The fiery furnace of affliction comes into your life. Do you really want to be used by God? Then you need to understand that being used by God means you're going to suffer affliction. Both in the illustration about the bread and also being under the hand of God at the potter's wheel. It's not easy to be pliable and to be malleable in the hand. So finally, the, they take that baker takes that bread out of the oven, and now finally I'm able to be used by God. And what does that man do? He takes that bread and he starts to break it and feeds the people with it. Every aspect of life in God Every aspect of the ministry is a way of giving and even of suffering. Billy Cole said God's, um, how do you say it? God's reward for sacrifice is more sacrifice. The more you give, the more you're going to have to give. Now, he will give back in return. You can't outgive God. But the moment you stop giving, the moment you close your hand, the moment you resist the hand of God forming you is the moment you stop growing and you stop being able to be used by God because what is he doing? He is using us for his glory. He is forming you into the man and the woman that he wants you to be. He is preparing you as a vessel of honor. He is preparing you to be used in ministry. Now that ministry isn't about just up here in the pulpit. The whole entire purpose of the quote unquote ministry, fivefold ministry, we call it, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, is to prepare the saints for the work of the ministry. And so each one of us has a job to do. It is extremely unbalanced for us to think that all of the work of the ministry has to take place by the pastor and by some people in the staff or some people in the church that call themselves ministers. No, everybody is supposed to be involved in ministry. Because the word ministry simply means to be a servant to other people. But that takes humility. And that takes a willingness to be on the potter's wheel and allowing the potter to form you and to mold you and to make you in the vessel, not that you want to be, but that God wants you to be. And so if you're right now living with a sense of frustration, maybe you're resisting the hand of the potter. Maybe you need to say, okay, God, not my will, but thine be done. Mold me and make me after thy will. We sing that song. We'll sing it here in a minute. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. 
I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. That word yield, we use that word. We know what it means. People that come to the altar, we say, yield to the Holy Ghost. They're like, what are you talking about? They don't even know what we mean until they get the Holy Ghost. Five seconds after we see the Holy Ghost, they know what we meant by yield. But until that time, but you have to be humble enough to yield to God's Spirit. And so we are the potter's work of grace tonight. We are our vessels of grace. God is forming us and making us in those vessels that will reflect His divine nature, His divine influence upon your heart, and then reflecting it in your life, and then the idea of being full of gratitude for it because He has put you in a position to never fall and to have an entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's stand. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. I wonder tonight if you're going through something and you're thinking, you know, I've been on the wheel a long time now and I just need God to help me. Or maybe you've been resisting the hand of God and you need Him to help you. Maybe you just want to come up here and say, Jesus, whatever you want from my life, I want it. Why don't you come forward tonight? Say, Lord, I submit to you. I yield to you, Jesus. I am not a finished. If you feel like you're a finished product, then by all means, don't come forward. But if you feel like you've still got some things to learn, and you're still under the hand of God, and you're still humble, you want to be humble, then come on up here tonight and just raise your hand and say, Lord, make me the vessel you want me to be and help me to be submitted to it. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and me. After thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. They're going to keep on playing that. If you want prayer tonight, come forward over here on this side, and I'll pray with you. The elders will pray with you. If you have a need in your body, if you have need in your life, if you're sick, if you need deliverance, just come forward right here tonight. Let God work on you. Let God touch your body. Let God make you whole tonight in the name of Jesus. Right here. Praise God. Lord, touch Sister Radkin's shoulder tonight. Kill her, God, right now in Jesus' name. Lord, by your will and by your power, we command this the body to come into divine alignment with how you ordained to be God in Jesus' name. Lord, let your virtue flow. 
take this inflammation down, God. Remove the pain, God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. I'm going to claim it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Anybody else want to come forward right now? Sister Sarah? Anybody else tonight? Anybody else tonight? Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. While I'm waiting, anybody else? Yielding and still. Praise the Lord, Sister Ed. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Somebody just say, yes, Lord. He's a healer. Why don't you raise your hand and just thank him. I thank you, Jesus, for touching all these that are here tonight. God, touch you.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mold me and make me what did I win? Well, Lord Jesus, we want your will, don't we? Look at somebody beside you and say, do you want the will of God? Do you want to be used by God? And you got to stay on the will. You got to let him. You're going to add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, temperance godliness, godliness brother kindness, and brother kindness charity. You know, the fruit of the Spirit has love in it. Love and charity is the same thing and faith. How many want to be full of faith tonight? Hallelujah. Just close your eyes right now before you dismiss tonight. And just raise your hands and just love the Lord. I love you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy to us. I thank you, Lord, for your grace tonight, the great teacher of God. Thank you for having mercy, for giving us and then having grace, God, to teach us about discipline. Give you praise, God, in Jesus' name.